This is an interview conducted by Jane. I use she, her pronouns on February 25th, 2020 at 115 for the Muncie LGBTQ plus history project. We are recording at the oral history lab at Ball State University. I'd like to thank Bryn for his time and the cooperation of our project as his story is important to our research to help preserve the LGBT plus history in the Muncie area. And can I have you introduce yourself, please? Sure, and pardon me for hiccups. Um, I'm dealing with pancreatic cancer and all the things that come with it. And so here we go, that's part of it. I'm just gonna roll, <laughs> oh, roll with it. But uh, yeah, my name is Bryn, Bryn Marlowe. I use the he, he, him, mm -hmm. those, those pronouns. Um, um, how old are you? I am 60 years old. And how long have you lived in Muncie? I have had a Muncie address for 30 some years. Um, I, I, I think it's high handed of the, the US Postal Service to decide which town I live in <laughs> um, because I may be close to Muncie, but I have a Muncie address right now, but we're 14 and a half miles outside of the city limits or outside of downtown. So it takes me a while to get here. So I use the term Muncie loosely to refer, my Muncie is Delaware County. My Muncie is a wooded, right now it's a beautiful wooded um, spot that is soul nurturing a house that was built in the 1930s. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my Muncie, but I've been here half, excuse me, half my life. Okay, um, have you ever lived away from Muncie? I have, I was born, Northern Minnesota is home for me. And I still, I can still feel it when we get closer to Northern Minnesota and the pine forests are coming in and it's just this whole wash of home is coming. So even though I moved away when I was five years old, following my dad's job down to Gary, Indiana, um, I've lived, I've called Minnesota home all my life. Only reluctantly and recently have I started claiming Indiana as home. Um, so what made you move to Muncie in general? Well, we, yeah, we came down, then my parents moved down to, to Gary, Indiana for my dad's job. We were, they had laid off in the iron mines where he worked up on the iron range up in Minnesota. They had laid off for a while. They were gonna push legis legislation through Congress that would let them reopen the mines. And so then all these people from, these immigrants from Minnesota were gonna go back. We were gonna go back home, we were gonna go back home. Then uh, three railroad, railroad tires fell on my dad's foot and crushed it on Christmas Eve. Um, he was, they did not take care of him that weekend because it was Christmas. Christmas gangrene set in, he wound up losing his foot. They would not take a, a one-legged truck driver back up in the mines. So we grew up stuck in Indiana. And we went home every summer from Minnesota. So, so I moved, yeah, we moved to Gary, Indiana then, or in its, moved out into the country to a place, place that looked like Minnesota. And then I wound up going to school at Taylor University, just up the road here. Um, graduated, from, graduated from there, went in to work with troubled kids in Indiana, working with troubled kids. Um, wound up coming back to Taylor. And that's when we couldn't find a, a place to rent near there, so we wound up in Delaware County and I have lived in Delaware County ever since. Okay. Um, as you know, we're collecting histories related to the LGBT plus community. What's a, that's a very broad history and how do you personally identify? It is. Um, I, I, I'm old school enough that I use the word gay for, my, for myself, and I think, bless whoever wants to call themselves whatever. Um, but yeah, I find myself, it's easiest in my lingo or, or my take on the world to call myself gay. I can identify as queer. I know some people have a pushback against that. Um, I can see myself on the spectrum. Um, I, there's some sense in which at the very beginning I kicked hard against, you can't, label, you can't label me as anything. That's what my whole society wants to do. I don't want to. I don't want to say this is me and this is my time spot. In I read Foucault and other theorists who are saying there is no such thing. Yes, there is such a thing. In the end, I'm a man who loves men, who finds himself identified and att attracted to other men, and that's I think has been true for me as long as I've been able to identify. Okay, so you've always identified as gay, or I have. That's a tricky. Yeah. That's, a, that's a tricky <laughs> one. I have no until midlife. I did not come out as a gay man until midlife. I was 35 when I came out as a gay man. Until that time, I identified as Christian. Mm -hmm. And I identified as Christian is different than gay, and you can't put those two together. And if, yet, yeah, there's no way that those two t can go together. So, so just by definition, I could not be gay. I knew that. I mean, that was, that was just a tenant of like a fish drinking water. That was a tenant of, of my belief system. So I did not identify as gay, but 
then once the light bulb goes on and I get this sense of, oh my gosh, look how much this explains. If I identify myself as a gay man, then that, that's why I had all these troubles in high school. That's why I had trouble in marriage. That's why I've had trouble relationships, dating women. It all makes sense. And I thought, okay, since that made so much sense to me, naive me, I thought, if I just explain that to other people, it'll make sense to them too. And I'll say, oh, Bryn, that's, that's why. That's not how it works. Yeah, so it was a big thing to identify as gay. Yeah, a lot of consequences okay. in my life. Um, was coming out an important experience for you? It was the watershed moment of my life. It's the, the most, yeah, the most significant, the most important thing I've ever done. And it has been the, mark, the marker, yeah, it's like AD or BC and AD, whatever. It's like before coming out and then after diving in. Um, yeah. Um, when did you come out to your family? I, yeah, can I, can I jump into this and just read a short essay that I've read? Yeah. Re I, like how, I like how putting things into, my thoughts into writing condenses things and I can say things quicker. Okay. And this doesn't answer all the questions, but it, at least the jumping off spot. This is a piece called I Did. It was published in Flying Island at the Indiana Writers' Center. I did. Did I grow up hearing the word gay mostly on Saturday mornings while watching cartoons, as in, when you're with the Flintstones, have a yabba dabba doo time, a dabba doo time, you'll have a gay, gay old time. And notice that a gay old time, week after week, involved mostly a grown man getting locked out of his own house and hammering at the door to be let back in. I did. did. Did I make my way through the world compliant and quiet, a middle child, a people pleaser who valued appearances because they helped keep the peace and make folk, folks happy? I did. Did I embrace Bible thumping tenets of my family with a fervor all my own, label my same sex attraction, sin, sinful temptation fanned by the flames of hell, plead with God to remove from me the stubborn desire to lust after other boys, promise to read my Bible two hours every day, never backtack my mother, become a missionary when I grew up, if only I could be cured? I did. Did I hear whispered that homosexuals are monsters, child molesters with horns and red eyes who lisp and can't hit a baseball? And know for a fact I wasn't one of those, even though the part about the baseball fit? I did. Did I learn that my rep did I lean on my reputation as a studious, sh shy type to avoid dating women during high school and college as much as possible? I did. Did I learn to live in my body as a house divided, keep at arm's length the despicable part of me that lusted after other men, assure myself that this was not the real me, and succeed so well as a college senior that I could find excuses to bathe when whenever the floor's resident Greek god padded down the hallway to the group showers wrapped only in a towel? and envy the towel, yet banish from my conscious, consciousness the idea that I might be gay. I did. Did I marry a hard-headed woman in the sincere belief that what I was doing was right, honorable, and holy, and in the hope that she would save me from myself only to learn that she did not have the power to change me? I did. Did I become a father to three sons, change diapers, play or read stories, play Robin Hood, sing songs, make funny voices, and discover that parenthood while demanding did not less, lessen my attraction to men, nor its accompanying self-hatred. I did. Did I finally devise a way to kill myself and test it on several small animals to make sure it worked? I did. I did all this and more, and although I peered into the void, I did not follow through with my planned suicide. After I composed my final farewell, I made a small choice for life, postponed my death for an hour, a day, a week. At such times, grace may be measured in minutes. Even as I believed that all hope was gone and all was finished, a whole new world was waiting to open up to me, to be born, a world in which I had never dared, Im dared imagine, never heard described in positive terms, never believed would receive, bless, and nurture the likes of me, a world in which I am, as accept I am acceptable as I am, loved without having to change, remake, or undo myself. Nowadays, I often see it reflected in my gay friends, in chosen family, in our shared laughter, warm embraces, generous regard. Here's the thing. This world had been there all along. It had been and is within, within me, within each one of us. The path is uncharted, the way perilous, the door hidden, the night dark, yet life endures, cloaks, cloaks itself even in catastrophe, calls to us ever and anon in tones loud and soft. 
May we with courage listen, respond, reach deep, take hold the key, prize open the door, and step into all that awaits us there. And did I, even now, as best I can, step through this door? I did. Thank you. Yeah, so that in summary to say, yeah, the coming out was important to me. <laughs> yes, this, this has been the before and after, the, the TikTok of my, of my life, the, thing that, the game changer that, that changed everything. And at the same time, was not well received by those in my peer, uh, community of influence. Yeah. So, how exactly did your friends react to ah! your coming out? Well, my yeah, my best friend I would have called would have turned my wife, and I was so naive. I thought seriously. I thought I'm not looking to get out of this marriage. I'm not looking to change anything. I just have this new piece of informa information I want to share with you, and I think it explains a whole lot. Come on, how can I be 35 years old and think that that's going to fly? And yet, that's where I was. I was, I was that sheltered, that naive. Uh, it did not fly, and it was not comfort, comforting news to my wife, who had believed, yeah, anyway, believed that she was marrying a, a man, straight man, who was different than, than who she was wound up with. So, as part of that, then my, my circle of influence, my family, my friends, were all tied into church. I, I was working at Taylor University, which is a Christian-centered college. Uh, I, was work, I was the lay leader in the local United Methodist Church, so I was preaching whenever our preacher was gone. My friendship base was either in, at work or built around people who were in the church. So when I came out, my, my family didn't know what to do with me. My parents, my parents, well, they heard that the church had called a council. Church was meeting, the leadership council was going to meet with me and give me an ultimatum. Either you go straight or we bind your soul and turn you over to, to Satan. So my parents came up to say, ah, I'm sorry, that's me. Turn off all cell phones, huh? This is medicine. Sorry, this is part of what it is living with cancer. Um, okay. I've got to take, sorry, I'm no, going to interrupt fine. long enough to take this medicine so I can be present to you through this. Okay. No, you're all good. So for what it is. Yeah, so church council was going to throw me out the door. My parents came up because, not because they wanted to plead my case, they just wanted to tell the preacher, go gentle on him. Somehow we were all swept into this thing that you follow church practice, whatever it is, whether it's heinous or not, whether it's kind to people or not. Anyway, that was that. My older sister came with them to have demons cast out of me. My younger brother, who was in the um, graduate program here, said that he believed that Satan had deceived me. Um, that was my family base, my friendship base. Uh, friends in the church were order, ordered as part of the church excommunication to have nothing to do with me, to say nothing to me. It was like that whole source of support vanished. As part of holding my marriage together, I agreed to meet with my best friend on a daily basis and say, I want to, best friend, I want to make myself accountable to you. This is what I've been thinking. This is what I've been doing. My actions are pure and upright and holy, or they're not, and this is what I, whatever. So I agreed to talk with him. As time went by, though, and I became more and more on the side, on the side of, I think the only thing I can do is embrace myself as a gay man. And I don't know what that means as far as being Christian, but it fits my history, and I want to I want to call things by their name, by what they are. The more comfortable I was becoming was saying, "Look, this is the only place I can go." The less comfortable he was becoming, to the place where he said his reaction was, "You know what? The very best thing you could do for your wife and kids." Just kill yourself. Get it over with. Take, your, take yourself out of the picture. Set an example. This is what happens to gay people. And then he went to the president of Taylor University and opened the conversation with him saying, did, did you know you have a gay man on your staff? Bless him. The president at that time said, I don't want to hear any names. There were other people who were listen, able and willing to listen to my best friends naming names. So it wasn't too long before I was out of a job at Taylor as well. So that, that went my friendship base. People either wouldn't talk to me, or people were ordered not to talk to me, or, yeah, it, it, anyway, it dried up. So that was, in a short order, there were two people, uh, one who had been a former student of mine who would still talk to me, and then a man who was in the church but was, but was outside the church, um, 
who had some connections. Those two people were the two people that, that said, we'd like to talk to you. We understand we're not supposed to, but we'll talk to you. Mm -hmm. Bless them. Yeah, but that's a narrow base to build a life on. So how did you deal with the rejection? Uh, I, I was, mm, I cried a lot. I moved out, it became obvious eventually that I needed to move out of the family to give my wife more space. Um, so I moved into a ratty apartment building in, Hart, in Hartford City. Um, I spent a lot of time crying. I tried to find resources and support. Where do I go? I th at that time, I thought I was the only gay person in Indiana. This is how naive I was, and this is, this is how advanced the internet was at, at that time. I was just dabbling around in the internet for Taylor, trying to figure out for the alumni office, like what could our presence, what does this World Wide Web thing mean? What does it mean for us? Um, and in so doing with them, then I found Christianity Online, which is a, a magazine that Taylor was maybe going to hook up with. They offered message boards, brand new thing where people could, it seems so ancient now, but people could leave their comments and one could respond to other comments from across the country or the world. There, they had three message boards that dealt with, can you be gay and Christian? I was like, I know the answer to that. How can you even dare pos posit that on this kind of a website? But it was a place where I could go to read other people's stories and think, okay, I'm the only man posting here from Indiana, but there are people from the West Coast and from the East Coast. So maybe there are gay people somewhere in the United States, just not here. A friend who was a little more savvy than me put me in touch with a Bible study being hosted at Anderson University uh, for, for LGBTQ people. I showed up there, it was all lesbians, so it still reinforced my idea that I am the only gay man in Indiana. But it was a jumping off spot, and it was a, wel a welcoming spot. And that was, so I was seeking support wherever I could find it, through, through online message boards, through this Bible study um, for mostly women in Anderson. There was a church in Indianapolis that was identified with the LGBT community, and so I wound up going there, trying to find friendship, trying to put my life back together in a kind of construction that I'd used before where the church was central. But the church was not being central because of how the church had treated me and I wasn't willing to trust the church. I wasn't, I didn't know who to trust. So I reached out in as many places as I could. I reached out to old friends, people that, yeah, that I started knocking on the, knocking on the door from out of the past, saying, here's my story, can anybody hear me? Basically is what I was saying, it was cries of help that I was, that I was sending out, trying to build a life wherever I could find it. Um, so does religion still play a role in your life today? Oh heavens, religion plays a, an interesting role. There's, I I don't like to be the typical. Well, I'm not, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, because I think I grew up, I grew up so dyed in the wool religious that this is how it is. That that I don't want to just trade out the the term religious now for spirit for spiritual and say that that cures everything because it doesn't it doesn't cure everything. It doesn't explain everything. But for me right now the I don't trust people in organized systems. That's part of my coming out has taught me. Don't trust the educational, higher educational system. Don't trust the medical system. Don't trust the legal system. Don't trust the religious system. Something happens when people get together. And so the, the church as an organized body wields power to shame, wields power to hurt, wields power in ways that are outsized for what I want it to have in my, in my life. I don't want it to have that much influence. So I refuse. I refuse to give myself, to make myself that vulnerable again. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not healthy for me. Given my history, the, the paybacks are, are not there for me. I bless my parents and bless my growing up for giving me a sense that there is more than what is seen, that I can't see everything. There's a quote by, I think it's Walker Percy, there are more things in heaven and earth, madam, than even a lifetime of li living in Tempe, Arizona will allow you to avail yourself of something like that. I keep telling myself there are more things in heaven and earth, madam. There are more than what I can see. There's more. I don't buy anybody who says, this is it. This is the end limits of our knowledge about the divine or about what's ever beyond us, or this is how, how God works, who God is. I don't buy that either, nor do I. Yeah, I'm, I'm just willing to say that there is so much. I'm so ignorant, so, so naive of so much that I'm at a place where I can hold. I would rather hold the questions and say, in this big bucket of questions that I hold, religion is one of the big ones. And what, what do I do with that? Spirituality is one of the big ones. What do I do with that? I know it can be nurturing. I think there's something there. What it is, I'm not willing to define. And I'm okay with that.
I think part of my navigating living in queer space, liminal space, in between things is an ability to navigate those questions and not have things spelled out in black and white because black and white is wounding. Um, so in these like Bible groups, you found like solidarity with these people. I correct? did. So were there other like ways that you, like were there other groups outside of religion that you found to be helpful? For me, the for me the starting point was religion. Mm -hmm. In that in that Bible study group, um, I it was run by two gestalt therapists in Anderson. This lovely couple, heterosexual couple, and they I was telling them I'm the only gay man. I'm convinced, the only gay man in Indiana. And they were like, no, you're not the only gay man, come on. We'll throw a dinner party, we'll invite some gay men and some gay supportive men so that you realize you, you are not alone. And I showed up at that, that meeting and true to their word, they had maybe eight or, eight or so other gay men or su gay supportive men there. One of those was the man who I would eventually fall in love with and marry. That was my husband, Dave. Uh, who, now we've been, we've been together 20, hmm, 26 years, 24 years. I'm not even remembering well here. We got together in 95, 96. Um, so, yeah, at any rate, that was the launching pad, was, was finding this close friendship in Dave that was outside the church. He was a hospice chaplain with, over here at Ball Memorial, so he was not totally outside the church, not totally outside my experience of organized religion. Had a sense of depth of, of religion that guided him and spirituality that guided him and pulled him through life. And yet it was outside the church too, because he was coming out, I was maybe six months walking in front of him on that coming out journey. And so we could, we could walk together and we could walk in trying to find sources of support. We found a coming out group for, for men in Indianapolis at that time. It was run by a therapist. Oh, and we, we became a part of that group. Every month we would go and share our stories and just listen to other people sharing their stories about coming, coming out and what that was. That, that group, that particular group, has gone on to meet, still meets once, once every month. Well, since I was diagnosed with cancer, now we're meeting once every other weekend, um, getting together. So bless them. There is staying power, which was a surprise to me in the gay community, that there is friendship and they can go, they can go long and last deep, or go deep and last long. Uh, yeah, so sources of, so that finding Dave, uh, finding that gay men support group, those were places where outside of religion, outside of the church, and yet were very nurturing. And then I looked for places, where can I go? Go to the gay bars, go to, go to Pride Day, go to conferences, go to workshops, go to readings, go to whatever, whatever, whatever. Help me address this vast ignorance in my, in my life. Those became sources of support for me as well. Um, you mentioned that you had three children. I do. So how did they react to your coming out? They were young when I came out. Um, they were probably really three, uh, twins were three, and I'm guessing Caleb was six. Isaac, Jacob, and Caleb. Um, they had a hard time. Their mom was, as much as I was dyed in the wool growing up in the church, so was she. As much as coming out of the closet door blew my life off its hinges, it did hers too. As far as it blew open my closet door, hers, the door of religion, in my estimation, slammed shut. And she found shelter and solace and st strength in bearing the hatches, battening down everything, making it as safe and secure as possible. And that was for our kids to, she was convinced in her church, and my church had taught me the same thing, that if those kids were allowed to have an ongoing relationship with me, they would wind up hellbound themselves. Yeah, we had an expert witness came in and testified at the court hearing that if this, if this man is allowed to uh, have continued contact with this youngest son of his, that son is gonna grow up gay. Was that counselor seeing some of the same things that my parents saw in me at a very young age? Was he just putting his finger on that? Was he, did, I don't know. Was he just making things up to scare the court? I'm not sure what. Um, but it, at any point, by the time my oldest son reached 10, he said, Dad, don't think anybody else is making me say this. Don't think anybody else is encouraging me to do this, but I don't want to see you or talk to you again. That was at age 10. I called his counselor and talked to his counselor. Um, his counselor said, basically, I'm here to advocate for this child and do the very best thing for this child, etc. And he needs not to have any contact with you. I think the best thing you can do is step away from him. Would I, would I make a different decision now? Probably I would. At the time I said, sure. All right, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can for the kid. Here, here we are. So run, be free. I understand that you have to live a life in that setting, in that venue, with that mother, 
the court had awarded uh, not joint custody but full custody to her. So the kids were going to be with their mom. They needed to survive. So whatever it, whatever it takes, Caleb, to survive. By, and had I learned my lesson enough by then, the other kids waited till they were 14, till they were 13. Because at 14, you can legally, as a minor, go before a judge and say, I want a restraining order against this parent. So just, just before my kid's 14th birthday, they went to the judge and got a restraining order against me. Their father's gay. They don't want to have anything to do with me. So the judge grants, grants that order. Um, I show up at their, at their house. Our house is decorated with uh, ribbons and gifts and presents. The cake is there waiting for them. I show up at their, their house and there's nobody there, no note on the door, no nothing. Just a dawning realization after an hour and a half that, oh, maybe there's something going on here that I need to, to find out more about. So, so their reaction was to distance themselves as well, follow in the, in the footsteps of their older brother, go by the court, court system, go by the religious training that they were getting, making choices that they could put together their life for. And so in some way, in the same way that I was having to make life choices, choose life for myself, bless them in having to do that too. I deeply regret and I'm so sad about what we have missed out on, where we could have gone, what things might have been. Um, but, but, there we, but there we are. And I, I don't see a, a way around that except to say this is what is. Um, now, last year, right before his 28th birthday, the youngest son, Jacob, reconnected with me. We spent four hours talking together, two hours with Dave, and then two hours we went out and put the chickens to bed. And J Jacob and I and the mosquitoes stood out and had cotton fly about in the yard. Um, he said at that time, I asked him, is, Jacob, is this a one-off thing? Is it your one and done? He said, I don't know. I don't know where, and he has, he's not made contact back with me since. I just said, I want to leave the door open anytime you're ready. But that's the only contact I've had with my, my kids then in, in the, the years since, since they distanced themselves. Yeah. Um, what was it like navigating the legal system as a gay man? I thought, see, I'm so naive. I'm so stupid. I thought that the justice system was about dispensing justice. It's not, and it doesn't need anybody any smarter than me to tell anybody that, anybody who has had that experience. But I, I, somehow I had this naive idea that, that I could find justice at the hands of the justice system. No, 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 no. Um, that's not my experience of it. And maybe some people find that. But what I found instead was my former wife said, do you mind if we transfer this out of Delaware County over to Madison County? Because that's where I'm living. I was like, no, no, make it. Whatever is easier on you, do that. <sighs> Madison County at that time is, is, was a bastion for, for the Church of God and for very fundamentalist thinking that pervades the legal system as well. All of the Indiana appellate court is right there with them. Um, what I found, anyway, my experience of the, the legal system was my, for, my former wife's lawyer seemed to take pleasure or great skill in whittling me down to where I felt like I was the size of a toothpick. I said to my lawyer, I never want my former wife to feel like that. I want you to treat her with respect. The judge says from the bench, Mr. McNabney, what's wrong with you? Usually you're a tiger in the courthouse. You seem to be like a kitten. And I'm thinking, well, I know why that is. But he was willing to listen to my advice. She's, the judge magistrate is willing to say from the court, homosexuality turns my stomach. I never want to see that happen to your kids. And I think, what? I thought you were the magistrate who was listening unbiased to this reporting, but you're telling me right from the bench that you're biased and that homosexuality turns your stomach, you're telling me you're, yeah, anyway, that that's not going to happen here. And the, the court orders that came out was very restrictive, um, limiting my, there, were, there was language in there like, that, that I shall not expose my children to any person, place, or event sponsored by or promoting the homosexual lifestyle. What does that mean? Hmm. No person, place, or event sponsored by or promoting the homosexual lifestyle. I usually don't see ads say sponsored by homosexual lifestyle. So I, I asked my lawyer about that. What does that mean? He says that means Bryn that when you are in the radio or when you are in the car with your kids and you're listening to the radio, you always have a hand on that dial. So if if there comes on a national news story about anything dealing with gay, you quick flip it off because these kids cannot be exposed to anything that has to deal with gay news, anything that might be seen as promoting the the homosexual lifestyle. I think what. 
And yet my children were able to come and say, Dad, we've been listening to these tapes by the American Family Association. Dad, we've been listening listen to these tapes by Eagle Forum, by James Dobson, that talk about you're going to hell. What you're doing is not right, etc. There was no restriction put on what those kids could, lis could listen to, or underneath other people's tutelage, but under mine, certainly. We appealed that to the appellate court and said, this is not right. This is, this is beyond, uh, beyond the pale. And the appellate court is like, oh no, we've got to protect these children from this gay father, because otherwise, look what's going to happen. They're going to all turn out gay. So that was my, yeah, in, in more than a nutshell, that was my experience and my disappointing experience with the, what, well, anyway, with what was passing, what was posing, what was enacted as the legal system in Indiana. So yeah. did that affect you outside of the courtroom? Like, did it affect, like, how did it affect your relationships with your children? Well, here, so here we go. So then the kids have power to go to, to their counselor, to go to the judge, to say, we don't want anything to do with our parents or with, with my, gay father, my gay father, I don't want anything to do with him. So yeah, it's had a, a blistering effect on our relationship as far as, as that goes and limit, limiting the time with them. And see, and how can I say, well, this was only the legal system that did this. No, it was societal sy system, it was the legal system, it was the religious system. It was all this stuff that works together to put those kids in a pressure cooker where they're being asked to choose between their parents to say, well, if we love mom, then we can't love dad because dad's a bat out of hell. Well, if we, if we say something pos positive about dad, then that means we're betraying mom. Nobody wants that for the kids, and yet that's, that happens, and the kids are put, in that, are put in that place, and the effects are deleterious over their, over their lifespan. For not, yeah, not only for them, but for other people who interact with them, other, other people who get sucked into this whole thing. We could show up at, the kids were homeschooled, we could show up at um, homeschool soccer, excuse me, soccer games, and I would ask, hey, anybody know when the next the next game is? And all the soccer parents were coached. Now, don't tell Bryn and Dave when the next game is, because we don't want them showing up um, to to support their kids at this game. We don't want them here. And I I go to the coach and say, come on, this is surely this is public information. When these kids are going to play soccer, he's like, well, you need to talk to your ex-wife. I think. Yeah, the ripple effect goes out, goes far beyond the little institutions or the people that lay the rules down, but it affects in insidious and invidious ways that it, it affects so many, so many things, so many aspects that I, I wouldn't even have a clue. Yeah, and I can't even name them. But yeah, yeah, it does, certainly has an impact on the way that we put our lives together. So were you like out to everyone by the time you got your divorce? Mm. I think my coming out is still an ongoing process and that I still meet people who, oh, I didn't know that about you. Um, but I am not, I am not shy. I'm not trying, you know, my per, part of that's my personality is that I'm not, I paid such a high price to come out as a gay, as a gay man. I'm not shy about letting you know that if the circumstances warrant. I also live as a, as a man in rural Muncie, Indiana, out in the cornfields. Um, I've been subject to harassment. Our house has been subject to vandalism. There is a threat of violence that just comes for me for living in a society that promotes homophobia and pr promotes violence against people. And so, so I think there are times where I choose to be prudent and not to, not to advertise myself more, more than what I feel safe in doing. Um, but I think, yeah, as far as I'm not, I'm not withholding information for, from people uh, and I, or from most people, I guess. I just walking through this pancreatic cancer. When I introduce my my spouse, say, "Here's my husband." Sometimes there's a like a little catch in the throat for whoever's meeting him, or is realizing, "Oh, oh, that's what you two are." Then um, I pick up on those things, or ah, and the the smile lights up, and my sister, her wife is whatever. So there's always a coming out thing, and who is who is a safe person in this medical system? Who can hear me? Who is a safe person in whatever system I happen to be interacting with at the time? Yeah. Um, we're especially interested in the LGBT commu community around Muncie. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about your experience? I am not a poster child for the LGBT <laughs> communi community in Muncie either. I wish I was. Um, I found my, my personal experience and just me living, and part of it is that I cho choose to live outside the city limits. And so I'm not in the thick of things down here. My my Muncie, as I said before, is one that's populated with coyotes and deer and 
wild geese and tame geese and chickens and um, one lone guinea fowl. Um, that's that's my that's my Muncie. So my trying to find other gay men who identify rurally in Muncie has been difficult for me. We've we found some we found some wonderful friends in Muncie, people that we <coughs> people that we touch base with, people that we're still in contact with, and yet the the soap like the soul click or the whatever it is when I have, I have a few and part of the, that's perhaps my person my personality and that of Dave's too is that a few friends going deep is more important to me than lots of friends going at a lighter I'm not a social butterfly um, I prefer the yeah the opposite of whatever that is um, so so finding a few friends with whom I can interact with on a deep level has been more important to me than finding lots of less less so anyway in my, my my experience of Muncie is that I can touch base with people and be a social butterfly um, but that doesn't provide me I haven't found those connections so much in Muncie that allow me the deep nur nourishing connections that I want I found those in my coming out group in Indianapolis for a long time I was more identified with the LG LBGT community in Indianapolis than in Muncie that was where I found this coming out group that was where I was going to this church that was um, within the LGBT community. Um, so um, my focus, my weekends were spent down in Indianapolis. I, I found it difficult to break into the community in Muncie. And I found when I did that it, it seemed cliquish, that there was a group that was centered around the college or centered around different schools in the college or different, yeah, different um, smaller groups within within the smaller group or there was a town group maybe and there's a group that's centered around mark three um, yeah but i didn't i didn't find it wasn't connecting with me in the way that most nourished me so i found my sources of support outside of muncie found those richer deeper found a gay couple that live over towards richmond live out on the farm grew up on the farm etc um, that we can connect I can connect with them in ways that I have not been able to connect with locally with people here. And then I find my way, I find myself connecting with, at one time I wanted to only connect with gay people. I don't want to connect with lesbians. I was like, I'm coming out, I'm looking for gay men, all I find is lesbians. When I'm trying to find my way through the world, I want, uh, immediately what I want is somebody who can tell me like, or show me myself. And I was looking th through the blurred vision and saying I need to look at another man rather than to see my experience portrayed in someone of a different gender. That's my own hang-ups, whatever. And maybe I'm old, old school enough, or that I was, anyway, I was buying into that time when the, the two groups were more separated. Um, but I found that true in, in Muncie then. I find myself connecting with straight women. I thought, oh my gosh, I never would have expected that, because I didn't expect to connect with women in the first place. And then I would have thought, surely, with more people of, in the lesbian community, but I find myself connecting of late, anyway, with deep friendships with people in the in the straight hetero uh, society in Muncie. So it's a for me, it's been a swirl and a interesting mix. I wish that I could say, oh yeah, Muncie, it's all this stuff. But for me, for me, it's yeah, um, Mark Three Tap Room, the Confetti's, I think, was the name of the gay bar that was briefly open. I was. I was still around, I think, when Carriage House was open or else it was going under at the time. The Mark III has been the one consistent presence. Um, these other ones have, have come and gone as far as a social presence. And then the Rainbow Cathedral, we attended services there for a while. Did not, did not find myself like connecting deeply committed to that group of people. Again, religious, all the religious baggage that goes with the organized religion. I didn't want to go there. Oh. Okay. Sorry, no, you're fine. No, no. Um, so what was your, what's the rural experience of being queer like? For me, it's, yeah, okay, so coming out, on, find, finding these people who are on the, on the seaboards saying, Bryn, what are you doing in Indiana of all godforsaken places? Come out here, come out to the coast. And, and these, these were wonderfully nurturing people. I had a, I was, there was a support group for people out of the Christian Reformed Church up in Michigan who somehow got a hold of me during this time when I was flailing and trying, trying, trying to find help somewhere. And these group of maybe a dozen men who were so warm and so inviting, in the end they are like, we've got frequent flyer miles, miles set a group out, in, or a couple out in California, we'll fly you out to California. We're gonna have a couple more friends from this 
online group who are coming out, come spend the weekend with us. It's like, what? People do that? That kind of thing? That's, how, that's what it means? Where my church is saying, away from me, my, my job situation is saying, I will have nothing to do with you. And here's these people I don't know from Adam who are reaching out and saying, Phew, on a very physical level, let us care for you, let us feed you, let us make sure that you're getting sleep, let us show you um, life somewhere outside of Indiana. I think, I, I had no idea. Uh, but I found, yeah, so, so those people, uh, yeah, all right, and this was all tying, somehow I'm trying to get this back to the rural, and what's, how does this fit in with my rural experience? Um, what I find is, though, that there are people who are warm and welcoming. At that time, I thought I could only find it on the West Coast, but I'm saying to those people, as warm and inviting as they are, no, I, I am farm-bred and farm-born, and I, this is where I want to be. Um, this is... I don't, want to, I don't want to hear that I have to leave the Midwest in order to find life. I'm not willing to do that. My, my sense of identity, as much as I can say I'm a gay man, I can also say I am a country bumpkin. I, am, I, find my, I don't find it nurturing. And at that point in my life, I was try, trying to put things together that were nurturing, that would give me life. Uh, and I wanted, in the, I know the rural life does that for me, the being in touch with nature, having nature at my fingertips. Uh, and what that means for me, and the the rhythm of life, the seasons, the movement of the seasons, the the change of crops in the farmyards around us, the wild animals that come, the not so wild animals, the chickens that have nurtured me all, all my life. I want to be able to be in touch with those people, or with those yeah, those people, those forces, those energies, um, all that they have to offer me. And I don't want to have to give that up in order to be gay. I don't want to have to say, oh, I have to live in downtown Muncie. I have to live in downtown Indianapolis in order to be gay. I, I resist that. I'm not willing to go there. Yeah, so there's a, there's a pride, there's a rural pride too that says, it's okay, there, there's a place for, for gay farm boys. Um, and whether we're visible or not, whether people recognize that or not, we're here. Yeah. So do you think there is a difference um, between, sorry, do you think there is a difference between like urban Muncie and how you're, compared to how you're treated in rural Muncie? Hmm. I let's see. I think some of those differences are ones that I bring with me. I think in rural Muncie, I, I'm, in rural Muncie, we were the target of ongoing vandalism over a number of years. I I've not had that experience walking into urban Muncie. <laughs> I don't have people sneaking up behind me, bashing, well, scraping, keying the car. Maybe um, we have a license plate on the back promoting the Indiana Youth Group. So I presume that's why the car got keyed. I don't know. Um, but, but no, people do not re regularly vandalize my property when I'm in urban Muncie, for the way that it has been affected in downtown, or in, in th at the house. Um, so I would see that difference. I, I, don't necessarily f mm, I don't necessarily feel safer one place or the other. I'm, I'm aware that in within my life, lived experience that uh, there was a, yeah, there have been crimes of hatred perpetrated against members of the LGBT community in Muncie, within my memory. Um, and I'm aware of that possibility and that those things happen, that they happen both in urban set and in rural settings. And so I'm not willing to give away all sense and say, oh yeah, I mean, it's fine here. I'm, I feel so safe. I don't, I don't necessarily feel all that safe anywhere. Um, there is a, there is a weekend where gay men get together in rural southern Indiana for four days out of the year, which is paradise for me, which is my, my one experience of life in Indiana that is like gay life as I would like it to be, where I'm, I feel totally safe and secure and can let down and be myself. And that's what I could wish for. I wish I could bring that, that back to, to my rural Muncie. I wish I could bring that back to this urban Muncie. And, and have that experience be a be an infused part of that that whole living and it's not there but i treasure it when i do get it and i bring back the little pieces that i can um my friends are asked so why not move to michigan <laughs> <laughs> is Mich see and here's if if you said minnesota i would say well yeah that's been the, the call of my life is to move back there to move go north young man go north yeah i i'm not i guess i'm not that attuned to michigan my heart's in Minnesota if I'm going to go somewhere. But, but now my, my love is in Indiana, and our grandkids are in Indiana, Ohio. 
um, yeah, these sources of support. Now, as I'm walking through last days, looking towards letting go of everything, maybe there's not time, or maybe I'm saying, oh, maybe I'm writing myself out of the equation too quick. Maybe I could run to Michigan these, the, last, the last time. But anyway, right now I'm leaning on those sources of support. So I understand in a deep way that, that those sources of support that I've leaned on that have pulled me through are the same ones that are pulling me through right now through this experience of, of living in, la in last days for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you view yourself to the gay community in that scene? How do I view yourself in the gay community? How do I view myself? Yeah. How do I see myself as? Sometimes I think I am, I am not a, yeah. I tell myself I'm not a good poster child for this is what it is to be gay because I, I continue to buck the system. I just shut up, Bryn, and, and st step into this, join our parade or join this thing or whatever. And I'm, I'm too cussed, like stubborn and independent to say, no, I'm making my own way through this, <laughs> through this journey. And this is how I'm choosing to put it together. And people who are in the church say, Bryn, but look what you're missing out on this, this communal support. I say, yeah, I miss out on the communal singing. I would love to do that. I like to get together and sing with people. I understand that there are, like, why aren't you here? At the, we've gone to see the Muncie Fem, Fabulous Femmes, and we've gone to Mark III for various uh, re reviews. Why aren't you doing this all the time? Why aren't you finding a source of support there? <sighs> because somehow that doesn't fit with the, the zeitgeist of my life or how I put things together. But, but there's a source of support. Yes, there is. But stubborn me, I'm choosing to put it together this way. Why don't, well, why don't you join this group what I, I'm very much touched by the Muncie outreach and I have friends who are involved in that why am I not and my heart is with gay youth why am I not part of Muncie outreach because I'm stubborn enough to put my life together I, I don't know whatever <laughs> so I see myself sometimes I think bring here these wonderful opportunities I could have made advantage of maybe it's the writer part of me that wants to be solitary and sit back and reflect and says I can't I can't expend my energy in all of those direct all of those directions Part of it is I grew up in a place where I believed I was inadequate as a person and I still have these voices in my head that says, you can't, you can't do that right, you can't do that right, no, you're not good enough. Um, so some of it is just that sadness that I, I think that I carry from those messages from the past and that I wish for people who are coming after me that we have a, a neighbor girl who's 16 now who is like in the last year has been able to make such a switch in her acceptance of herself and making a space for her in a local school system that did not was not welcoming to her in her freshman year to, but now this year she's she's come more into herself and more into her identity and more into a sense of rightness about herself and I look at her and I think bless you child that's exactly what I hope for for the the people who are coming through or coming after me too is that 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 can be their experience, that they can find a, a welcoming sources of support, nurturance, pride, that they can push down, everybody's going to have the negative voices, but that they can push those down, deal with them more effectively, more skillfully, sooner, and, and have a bigger launching pad for the rest of their life. Um, going back to the, the weekend retreat, Oh yes. Um, who organizes that? Ah, that's by a, there's a, there's a group called uh, Mankind Project International, which is a, it's not identified as a gay group, it's a men's group, came out of the men's movement, uh, that's in, that's hyped up on, on providing men with initiatory, initiatory experiences, seeing that when we make the transition from young, young manhood into early adulthood, we don't have any of the marker things that other societies have traditionally given. So they're, part of their claim to fame is to say, let's give men these marker experiences. And so they, they hold an introductory weekend where they initiate men into manhood, whatever that means. And then they followed up with a big support system where coming out of that group, then I continue to meet with that same group of men that I went through this intense experience with. And we are in weekly support and accountability sessions for a given amount of time. And then we may meet monthly or bi-monthly to continue those kind of things, to make personal changes in our life. Within that, out of all places, Indiana came up with a strong LGBT contingent within, within this Mankind Project International. And I think, what? Where did, that, where did that come from in Indiana? Because that's not my, 
my experience that Indiana is leaders in the field, but within, within that group, Indiana anyway began 20 some years ago, a group called the um, Rainbow Warrior, Rainbow Warrior Gathering. Is what they call this, and that's this this reunion that I'm referring to. Once, yeah, once for four or five days out of the weekend in southern Indiana, the Rainbow Warrior Gathering gets together, and it is upwards of a hundred men, sometimes more, sometimes less. Very relaxed weekend, none of, none of the intense initiatory processes that we go through, but a space we all have each other's back. We're all men on a set out on a path of of intentional self-awareness and growth. We're nurturing each other. We've learned coping strategies, coping skills. We've been trained in similar kinds of skills so that we, we, have, yeah, we have abilities to come alongside other people who are hurting and say, dear brother, this, this may be your issue, but you're touching these issues for me. Let me share this out of my experience. So in ways that are non-invasive, non-intrusive, non, non-directive, but ways of sharing our experience. Anyway, we have access to lots of different ways to, to, to be in support of each other. And then there's a wonderful creativity that comes together when gay men get together and are allowed just to have fun. We have a, a no, they call it a no talent, show, no talent show party, but where these fabulously talented men get up and sing arias and do hilarious comedy routines and so, some things that are really touching, really moving, other things that are just drop down funny, rolling on the floor. Yeah, so it's a celebration at the same time, but it's just a celebration that has, has been enabled because of what we've been through in sharing a common history as gay men. And these are men from across the country, strong, strong contingent from Indiana. In fact, this weekend, um, there's a neighboring group meeting down in Texas. This weekend, the radio, radio gather or radio rodeo roundup or something. Anyway, it's an uh, offshoot of what we've done in Indiana. So it's growing in Texas too, which is fun. That these, yeah, these, whatever, feel, uh, yeah, the exp- experience, the, the things that we've had, we're being able to share with other parts of the country too. So I'm proud of that. Um, yeah. When does this um, retreat happen? It happens in the fall. And it's restricted to men who, are, ha- who have gone through the New Warrior training adventure um, and then who have come out, identified themselves as either by gay, trans, somewhere on the, on the on that spectrum, um, yeah, who are a part of that then. So. Um, so are you like, are you like an, I don't know what you'd call like an officer in this group or just? In that group? No, I'm a, I'm an active volunteer, active okay. participant, okay. I guess I would say. They, yeah, when they, when they put out a call to say who wants to be in leadership of this group, I always said, no, I live in Muncie, you guys are in Indianapolis, <laughs> you guys can provide the leadership and I'll provide wholehearted support from up here. Um, eventually, the Indianapolis leadership stepped back two years ago, and now we have a director who's out in New York and New Hampshire, other places across the country. I'm thinking, oh, so I let my I'm too far away in Muncie to to be my ex- my excuse to say I can't be involved in the leadership. Um, but now, in these last two years, uh, these other men have taken that leadership role, and I'm happy to let them do that and to be a I'm a strong advocate and supporter of what goes on there. And and yeah, for me, it's a it's been my snapshot of saying, yes, this is, gay community can happen in, in a deep and meaningful way. And this is what it looks like for me. Um, also going back to the vandalism. Um, oh, yeah. So how have you dealt with the, like, how has the police response been? Mm. My, experience with, my experience with that, our, the first time our mailbox was bashed in, ours was the only mailbox on that country, country mile to get bashed in. It was two weeks before Thanksgiving. I'm not, I have, a, I have a heightened sense of paranoia, just part of my personality, and my coming out process did not do anything to diminish my heightened sense of <laughs> paranoia. Um, so when I see this two weeks before, th- before ha- Halloween, I say, I want this documented. It may be a Halloween stunt. It may also have something to do with us being two, two gay men. Obvious to anybody who lives in a rural area that there are two men living at this house. Obvious that there's a um, a play structure out in the yard, tree fort that the kids can cl- climb up in. Obviously, we have kids, but they're not here all the time because you don't always see them. We have had people. Uh, Dave was out in the yard. The car slows down. And some somebody screams the word "fag." Um, so it's not that our presence has gone unnoticed there. So I call the police and say I'd like to file this as an incident report. 
the officer comes out and my experience as well is like uh, poo poos are yeah well so it's right before Halloween you're getting your mailbox big deal I'm like well let's note Mr. Pol Policeman that this is the only mailbox on this street that got it okay so let's just note that in your records I just want this documented in case anything more happens of this I don't want you to say well this has never happened before anyway it carried on from that time on and probably for a span of two or three years our mailbox was regular bashed in people would come by and smash it and so then I look up what do you do with smash mailboxes well one thing you can do is you know, like form, form fill put a concrete inside concrete so we'll put a small mailbox inside a big one and then fill the inside with concrete so that when this guy comes by with his baseball bat he hits concrete and breaks his bat rather than our mailbox so not responding in a non-violent way altogether but trying to set some kind of boundary anyway that that pissed off our vandal so the next i mean i'm sure i don't i wasn't there when he when he hit found out that it was concrete i don't know whether he got hurt or not but i do come out and he's got this white truck and he's just ramming 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 back backing up ramming our mailbox that's full of this concrete so he knocks it loose and then he peels off down um, so I call our friendly neighborhood policeman and say I'd like to file another incident report this time when he comes out he's like oh so who do you got on your street that hates you or has got it in for you like, I have no idea we don't know our neighbors this this is not the rural Indiana that I grew up in we don't know our neighbors we've met these people but I have no idea but somebody I said but look here two men living in Indiana rural Indiana how much does it take he didn't want to go there that policeman but he's willing to fill out the documentation report thank you sir so anyway in in this long thing and we have a, a history of him coming back to fill in more reports because what happens then is this guy has knocked loose our mailbox so oh so now i can just lift the whole post out well for a while we were taking okay for a while we we're taking just our mailbox in you want to bash our mailbox we'll just take the mailbox in so then he started bashing the post in knocking the post over okay so then you loosen that so then i'll just put the mailbox back in the post and take the post and the mailbox in so trot it up at night and so then our vandal comes by and there's nothing out there for him to bash or run over so he get he gets angry at that my surmising because then the next incidents are increasing vandalism to the house um, egging the house so and the, the policeman had told me well at least if he can't get to the mailbox one of the things the policeman suggested was get a, get a mailbox in town then he can't get to your mailbox he's going to have to step onto your prop step onto your property in order to vandalize your house well okay so he was willing to do that so the house get the house gets egged i i can't remember everything that was happening i know we found a report at some time there was an anthrax scare where people and bags of anthrax were being mailed to democratic congressmen through the mail well at our house at that time then one of the things is we had little plastic bags of suspicious looking flour um, sitting on the front porch and along the mailboxes and flour along the walkway as if we should be afraid that someone has sprinkled anthrax in on our front yard so I, I get the, the policeman to come out again to look at this document this here's one more thing it seems yeah and I'm, I'm losing what the creativity it seems like our, our vandal was fairly creative with coming up with with different things to do the, the last thing they did was was set fire to the to the front porch um, and I were just getting ready to go see Dave's dad the morning we come out the front porch and there, it's obvious somebody's lit fire to the front porch so I'm like I know we're supposed to be at your at your at your dad's now we need to be leaving but I want to call and get this incident report in because if they're setting fire to the house now <laughs> anyway I want this it's important enough to me to get this documented at that time we had a, a woman on the police force came out and bless her heart um, she was the first one who I felt like could get what we were going through and she was understanding she said look you guys you need to go get mace you need to get it in this quantity this strength these are some tips here's some brochures this is things you need to do to, to, to protect yourself use common sense and I felt like she was the first one who, who treated our concerns in the way that I felt like yeah this is serious enough that this person is is continually coming back at you um, so that was that was both scary to hear someone in the police force reaffirm that and it's also comforting to say at least somebody understands we're not totally out, out of this altogether
But what to do? Do I, do I pick up and leave the house because somebody doesn't like us there? No, there's this entrenched gay man who's crossed his fingers and says, I'm staying here in Indiana. I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. It has lessened this, I think this year, we were only egged once um, in, yeah, in the screen, so it got stuck in the screen, which is mm-hmm. nastier yet. Um, but it, it has not been a constant thing, and maybe the person got tired of it, maybe because we didn't, maybe, I don't know, maybe, who knows? Hard, hard to understand, to read anybody's mind, my own, let alone anybody else's, but hard to understand why that stopped or diminished, and it has, and I'm grateful. So how long did this go on for? It went on, oh, that was over the course of maybe two to three years okay. where we were having something regularly. Now it's like the egging now. So it's been several years since since that. So maybe once a year or twice a year with the egging. That's, okay. a, that's a thing. Our mailbox gets bashed every once in a while, but not like with the frequency that it was. So it does seem more random now or the latest cr- latest crop of I might be biased here of teenage redneck boys who are going by who say, oh, time to bash the fags or something, but at least they're doing it to the, to the mailbox rather than to the people. <laughs> My fear is, though, that there's a, I mean, once it's okay to do it to property, it's okay to do it to the person, and where do you stop? And it's not appropriate. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, from the get-go, the name-calling, the, the ways in which we cut each other down become eventually become physical, and we pay the price in our bodies. Yeah. Um. Can you tell me more about your family of origin? My family of origin, wonderful people. Um, Mom and dad grew up in northern Minnesota. My grandparents lived, they were white people who lived on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation um, in northern Minnesota. My mom grew up in a community of Finnish immigrants. My grandpa grandpa came over from Finland when he was 16. Um, They were hard scrabble farmers, trappers, loggers, did whatever they could to make it through. Um, these, two, these two people um, fall in love with each other. They get married. Dad goes off to the Korean War. He's drafted into the Korean War. They make a life for themselves. Um, they find out that the world is bigger than, than northern Minnesota. Um, but yet that's where they go back home. That's home. That's home for them. And then Dad's working on the Iron Range. By that time has five kids trying to take trying to take care of five kids when the, the mines close down. So they come down. So hard scrabble growing up and then trying to make your way in a world, five, ch- five children. I have a much better appreciation now as an adult what that meant for my parents than when I was the middle of those five kids. Um, two older sisters, two younger brothers, a family that, that loved each other and could say, we love you. A family that was, my parents found religion and were zealous about the religion. And, it offered things to them that they hadn't been able to get in the in their growing up experience, um, and so they made sure that their kids were were dyed in the wool Christian churchgoer people, and that yeah that gave us they gave me a firm foot, firm footing as far as spirituality goes as far as understanding that there's something bigger than me out there um, as far as what family dynamics can look like I thought I thought my family would love I thought love was just like a permanent thing. And that if you love somebody, you're always going to love them. That's part of my naivete. Um, but, but then, yeah. So in my family of origin, my parents, my parents were forced in the end to choose or force themselves or their own thought process forced them to choose between church and child. And in the end, what they came down to is choosing church over child. And I'm sad that anybody ha- has to make that decision or feels like they have to make that decision. And yet I respect that. That's where they were. Um, that's how they put their life together, that, that, that their religion always came first. And they, their support group, like my, my support group was all stripped away from me when I came out as a gay man. When their son comes out as a gay man, their support group is these people who believe the same way that they do, have been taught the same thing. And so who, who say, you know, you really need to get them to P-Fox or this parents and family of ex-gays. Don't be going to, to these P-Flag meetings because they're just going to support you in the devil's way. That's not what my parents needed to hear. Anyway, but, the, but that's where they were, that's where they got. That's it. And then my, my siblings, grown up in the same kind of milieu, the same environment. My, my next younger brother, uh, counseling, head of the counseling department for a local regional medical center, testified in court that, that 
he is one of those psychologists who does not believe, did not, not all psychologists believe that homosexuality should have been taken off of the list of mental orders. Um, that he would not trust me, his brother, around his children, to be alone with his children. Uh, but he was not there to testify against his brother, but he was there to testify in defense of his faith. And, I, and our judge lets that go, our magistrate lets that go through the court system. Like, we're not here to testify on anybody's faith, I didn't think. Anyway, but, but there we are. Yeah, so my, my brother is doing what he thinks is best. And part of what he, and then in later life he becomes a weekend minister in the same faith congregation that I grew up in, or the same, same non-denomination. So he's died in the wool into the church and his support group, and he is able to say now, in later years, my, our, our parents are both are both dead now. He's able to say it would be dishonoring of, of our parents' memory, Bryn, if I had anything to do with you. So no, you're not welcome at my house. No, the family reunion is being held here, and everybody's welcome. But that doesn't that doesn't mean you and Dave. The way that I'm putting my life together, I don't even understand why you'd want to be a part of this. Because basically we don't have any part for you. There's no place for LGBT people. Which makes it difficult in the family, in the larger family then, because I have some siblings. I have this one brother who's very much, you are not welcome here. I have a sister, oldest sister, who has said, you are welcome here. We're not going to let anybody else tell us how to live our life and who we can love. And yet, yet they get messages from their fellow siblings and how does that affect the family. And then there's, in this family that was purported, purported to be so full of love and grace, whatever, it kind of fell apart after my parents died over my having come out. And maybe it was falling apart when I came out. And that, that the family was split over the religious schism and, and that's what happened. But that's how it's affected. The, yeah, the family of origin has been, has been touched and influenced by, by my choices in coming out. So your sister that supports you, do you still like keep in touch with her? She was just up for this last week. She came up to spend a week with me to just take care of Dave and I and uh, offer us support and just we'll help you out. We know this hard medical transitions you're going through. So yeah, very much her love is in action. And as I'm, bless her, uh, strong, strong me memory of my dad's love for me was whenever us kids would get sick, I would be leaning over the toilet and dad would have his hand right here one hand here and one hand on the back saying, let it come, let it come, you'll feel better, you'll feel better. And I'm sitting talking to Elaine, I'm on the couch and suddenly the nausea comes and I start vomiting. She's up off that couch, sitting right beside me, one hand right here, one hand on my back saying, let it come, let it come. I'm like, Elaine, there's no way you could stronger channel our father's love than that like immediately running towards me when I'm at my, at my worst and at my most vulnerable rather than rather than pushing me away or whatever, you're coming right at me. Um, and you're just channeling. I see how my parents' love comes through. And then because, because she's very much in the religious milieu, then I can say to her, I hope you're able to hear this, Elaine, too, that that's our Heavenly Father's love, that you're channeling that love, too, in the way that you've been here this week, taking care of us, get, extending yourself. Um, those are words that I can use for her because I think she can understand them. Those are, those are not the words that I use to describe the situation to myself. But but very much to feel the love that comes when I'm at my weakest, when I'm at my most vulnerable, and people can reach out and take me as I am, even when it's not pretty. Uh, but to say, you have value, you have worth, let it come, let it come, it'll be all right. This too shall pass, you'll get better. Yeah. So do you have any other biological family that you still keep in touch with? I have, my, well, bless my grandmother. I should not let this interview go by without mentioning her. She was 90 years old when I, when I came up. I sent her the same coming out letter that I sent to my parents and to my siblings. And where my parents came down to tell the church to, to be merciful on me, my sister comes to have demons cast out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my grandmother says, he is still the same boy we've always known. Um, he's no different than who he was before. And he is always welcome in my house. So that summer then, Dave and I go up, there's a family reunion being held. Um, I get the word from my parents as even as we're driving up there, I don't know, if, are we going to make it to this family reunion or not? I drive up there and they say, no, you're not welcome. You and Dave, well, you are welcome at this, at this family gathering, but if Dave sets foot on the property, we're going to escort him off the property. So I'm like, this is the man I love. This is the man who has partnered with me through hell and back. I'm not going to come step onto the property and leave him. I'm just not going to do that. Grandma says, go visit your mom. She's your mom. She needs to see you. 
like, Grandma, I'll come visit you. And Grandma opens her house to us, says, you can come sleep, sleep on my sofa in this senior living apartment kind of thing. You are welcome here. You are always welcome here. My parents could not extend that. But she, she at age 90, and she lived to be 103, and to be a beacon that just burned bright for me. Uh, all that time, well, all my life she has, but yeah, of, ex of acceptance and love in action, and reaching out, actively caring for people, and not letting, not giving way to all this other stuff that gets in our way of loving people. Yeah. So how would you describe your family now? My family now is the family of choice. <laughs> yeah, the family that I've been able to put together, and those include both members of my biological family, and wherever they want to fall in the spectrum, I have a, yeah, I, yeah, so they're wherever they want to fall. And maybe it's best to let them put themselves to come as close as they want to, to me. My, my one brother who says, I don't want anything to do with you. That's very clear. My other sister who comes to pat my shoulder when I'm vomiting. That's very, very clear. The other siblings are somewhere in between. Um, okay, so family of choice includes Dave, this man who I've been married to, my partner of my heart. Um, yeah, my north, my east, my south, my west, mm -hmm. everything. Um, these men who I've gathered with for 25 years in this monthly meeting, they're a part of my family of choice. The family of choice in these men in Richmond, uh, soulful country dwellers, are part of my family of choice. These, these straight women who are loving and graciously so connected to us and to making, making this family work um, are, yeah, our neighbors, our 84-year-old neighbor lady who has been wonderfully supportive through this. Um, yeah, the people, the people who by their actions and by their demonstrated love show that, I mean, are doing those things that, that are my family. That's who, that's who I call my family. And that's, that's, those are the places and the people, the very people that I rely on now in this journey into pancreatic cancer. Um, that's who supports me now. And it's, it shouldn't be a big surprise to me that the people who have supported me are the ones who are supporting me now too. But, but I, I even see in a deeper way, yeah, this family costs, there's a price when we care about people. There's a price to loving people, to letting go, to putting ourselves out. Yeah, holding each other when we're vomiting, whatever, whatever, the, whatever that is. But yeah, that's all part of what makes a family of choice. I'm so grateful, so grateful for that. Mm. So how long have you and Dave been married? We got together in 96, um, and we've been married, so, yeah, I mean, in my heart, we got together as soon as, as we have th traditional gay couple, we have three anniversaries, right? The first time we ever went to bed together, um, the first time, well, the, the day that we met each other, the first time we ever be went to bed with each other, uh, the first time we moved into a house together. So those were our three anniversaries. When it came time, when Ottawa, province of Ottawa had okayed gay marriage. And it was splattershot maybe in Massachusetts you could get married, um, Vermont had civil unions, whatever, but Canada, or yeah, when Ottawa came, yeah, when Ottawa came forward and said, we're gonna have legalized gay marriage in this province, my dad had just died of pancre uh, prostate cancer. The prostate cancer had gone through his entire body, just shot through, um, and he and my mom colluded my, my judgment colluded with each other to say, there's no cancer here. Nothing's wrong with us. We're getting better every day. They were not, but denial runs really big in my family. Here I am, living proof of the power of denial. And here were my parents, living proof as dad was dying, that you can ignore the cancer until the very, until the very end. Um, and so he tried that. It didn't work real well for him. He went into the hospital two weeks before he died. I was, I was very much touched by his example in a way that said, dad, that's not that's how I do not want to live my, my final life, my final year on earth. If I'm no, so as soon as I got word that he was dying, that he had died, I said, I'm gonna take this next year from when, he, from when he died till a year from now to live this, pretend as if it were my last year on earth. And I'm gonna do all this prep stuff. I didn't do it all. Looking back now, I didn't do it all. But I wanted to get as ready as I could. And so I was lining up my things saying, okay, my bucket list, if I have one year left to live, from dad's funeral these are the things we went down to dad's funeral on our way back i was i was saying to dave my parents my society only gives me so many ways to say i love you and and i have to speak in the words that my society gives me my parents i watched my 
I watched my parents singing love songs to each other as they were sitting there in the hospital bed. As dad is dying, they're holding, holding hands and singing love songs to each other. And I say to Dave, you know, their 50 years plus of marriage is the way that they've been able to say most effectively and most deeply, I love you, you are so important to me. I said, I would like to have that experience before I die, if this is my last year. So I turned to him and say, will you marry me? He says, yes. About six miles down the road, he turns to me and says, will you marry me? Yes. So we, we knew that Ottawa had just okayed gay marriage, so we weren't asking pie in the sky. We could, so then we set into, set into force those motions that could get us married in Canada. So which of these wedding anniversaries do we chose? We chose the middle one, which, which would have been what? The first time we made love with each other to be our, our wedding anniversary. So we, we went to Canada. We had to apply. Yeah, and we had jumped through Canadian hoops to make that happen. Go up and see, meet with a barrister there ahead of time and come back and go back for the wedding, etc. cetera. Um, but so we were officially married then on, I'm going to get the dates wrong, March 9th, March 7th. Um, whatever year that was, 2005 or six or four. Um, so yeah, so we've been officially married then. And then people, people get stuck on this and it feels weird to me. It's like, well, how long have you guys been married? I want to just say 25 years. No, no. How many years have you actually been married? <laughs> well, since Canada then. It's, no, no, no. But when was that recognized in the United States? I think, okay, well, when the Supreme Court recognized it across the board. Then. So so I used to have three dates that I got married. Now the people that I interact with want to put those three dates back on me. It was, yeah, either this or the Supreme Court or the whatever. Yeah, so it's a, it's a question, but there we are. So how did it feel coming back to America and not having your marriage recognized? Oh, heaven's sakes. We went, yeah, so we went, our friend Serge, mm, that's a whole other story. Our friend Serge went, was with us at some point on these travels. We went up with him and some other friends to... Um, to Mont yeah, Montreal to Niagara Falls. Um, we w were on a vacation shortly after, shortly after, now the wedding itself coming back, we knew that was going to happen, that we were back here in Indiana. No way are you married in our state, come hell or high water. Mike Pence is riding to the rescue <laughs> of Christianity and all that's right and holy. Okay, but then later vacation, we're on vacation in Niagara Falls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was like on that vacation that we stitched together, we went into New York, into equality states. We were in Massachusetts for a little while. We were up in Canada. So we had like 10 days in a row where we were legally married. And then shoot, we shoot into Ohio and over to Indiana. And suddenly, bing, there it was just by crossing the state line. Now we're back into another place. I think talk about mental, like how do you put a life together? That Okay, in this whole country to the north, yeah, you're married. No, in this state over here, yes, you're married. Yeah, and in the one that borders it, you are. But no, the further you get to Muncie, Indiana, you are not married. <laughs> it's discombobulating, and it's also ridiculous. There's a part of it that's funny because it's stupid. There's a part of it that's not at all funny and that is dead serious because these things have real-life consequences, and people do wind up getting hurt in, yeah, in dramatic ways because of the, the practices and the, that it condones and the attitudes that it fosters yeah um so when the supreme court did pass it was mm -hmm. your mar your canadian marriage then recognized it was recognized yes okay. yes as soon as as soon as everybody down here had to recognize then the reciprocal agreements okay. are put into place um, is there anyone else that you think we should interview other than dave uh <laughs> yes well you missed by you missed by a day yesterday my friend serge had flown over from from uh, yeah, from Toulouse, south of France. He spent the weekend with us. Um, that was the first man I ever fell in love with. First human being that walked the planet. That when, I was a, when I was in college, I fell in love with him. I'd gone over to England, spent a semester working with inner city London kids. Um, met Serge at this camp that was, we were co-leaders for these teams together, for these younger kids. Fell in love, he came over, surprised me. The next year came over to my grandmother's house in Minnesota when we showed up there for a family vacation. There was Serge. We had a sexual relationship that summer. At the, at the end of September, he asked me, come away, make a life with me. We'll, we'll go to wherever, Ireland maybe. Um, and I was like, no, no, Serge, there's no life in that. There's no future. There's no, no hope for any kind of joy in that kind of relationship. Go, go. Look, here's what we're going to do. 
we're both going to get married someday. I'm going to pay for you on the plane flight. You come over and be in my wedding. When you get married, you pay for me and I'll come over and be in your wedding. Okay, deal, deal. Yep, okay, we're not, gonna, we're not gay, right? No, even though we've been making love all summer. Um, okay, but so then he goes off heartbroken and I regret that the rest of my life. Here it was on a, on a silver platter, maybe a feature that I could have chosen and I did not, I did not take it. Serge did have the gumption, bless his heart, come over and was in my wedding when I got married to a, a woman. Tension was thick in the house when he came back in later years to visit because here's former lover coming to visit, now spouse. And anyway, yeah, it was not always easy. Sometimes that's an exaggeration. It was far from easy. Anyway, Serge and I have remained friends ever since. Um, we honeymooned at Serge's house after, after our Canadian wedding. We wound up going over to, to Toulouse and stayed with Serge and his now husband, Vladimir. Um, so Serge was here this weekend. He could give you the international perspective <laughs> and on the, an insight into long-term relationships that can be forged in, of all places, Indiana in Delaware County. Well, anyway, that, that these things can and do happen even in this neck of the woods. So, but otherwise, yeah, no, I'm good with that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? There's always more to be said and I've <laughs> nattered on so long. Thank you so much for, for listening and for your attentiveness. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to cover though? Hmm, let's see. You hit big ones for me, spirituality, religion, slash legal system, friendship-based family, family of origin, um, job. I guess we haven't talked about job in, in Delaware County. Oh, we haven't. For me. Um, yeah, there was, I have worked at places, well, at Taylor, where there was no place for a gay man. And Taylor is still wrestling, still wrestling, still wrestling with there being no place for an openly LGBT person on staff. And that's too bad. It's too bad it's, that that's how it is. And that's how it is. That's where places are. Okay, so that's, that's within my experience of living in Delaware County and working at Taylor. And then um, I've worked at a couple other places. I've been a long-term employee in Delaware County and came out early to them as a gay man just because it was part of the court, everything that I was going through. It was dicey at first. I wasn't sure of my, what my welcome would be, but neither did I want to work there long term if they were not going to be welcoming of me. So somehow they made, they made space for me. And I know that, I know that sometimes I'm the target of, of gay jokes or have been, maybe I've been around there long enough now that my personality is its own joke and they can poke fun at me for many, many other reasons than, than my orientation. Um, I know they're not always, it's not a place that's, uh, it's not a workplace that is free of discrimination. I think every place has that. Um, and, and ours certainly does. And yet I've been able to make a life there and to be able to find a place to fit and live. Yeah, I think in some ways my coming out gay like stopped the trajectory of my career in publications and public relations, especially with Taylor. And then just the, the emotional cost that it took the cost of coming out sapped, like wherever my career was going, I, I changed it instead into learning how to live and how to accept and embrace myself and to live that kind of a life. And so my energies, that maybe my life would have been totally different had I been born 20 years later or had I made other choices, even in the time that I was born. Um, but I think that's just a reality for me and maybe sometimes a suspicion for other gay men of my era or older than me, we made our own choices and that's why I have, made, and it's easy for me to project onto the future of younger people saying, you have this boundless opportunity. Everything will go perfect for you because it didn't for me. Well, everything's not going to go perfect for you. I know that and you're going to have your own set of challenges, but I hope that they won't be the exact same ones that I had to slog through. I hope that some part of that trail has been blazed. Yeah. And that that will, that that will happen. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I think that's it. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Don't forget your microphone. Very good.